You have joined us live here on the epicenter of conversation, the mothership of debate and dialogue when you discuss Alabama football and a hump day that being in my own words, the podcast with yours truly, your man, Stephen M. Smith of Touchdown Alabama Magazine coming to you from Tuscaloosa, streaming this to you as always via YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, if you are new to the channel, new to the network and the brand, the show here, go ahead right now and smash that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button right now and turn on your notifications so that you can have the hottest, the freshest of updates, content, and coverage on your Alabama Crimson Tide. Got a great show planned for you guys on today. And we want you being a part of the show. 205-448-1358. Phone lines open. 205-448-1358 to call in. Let your voice be heard. 205-448-1358. But the show, every single time, bigger than me, more than me. I got my partner in crime, my brother from another mother. We got the producer, the band man, the maestro, John Ivory in the building. JP, let him hear you. Hey, what's happening? Let's get it. It's hump day. About to have a fire show tonight. Roll Tide. JP already prepared and ready to go. As we mentioned, we've got a great deal of topics to get to. It's going to be fun catching back up with Matt Cadell, former Alabama wide receiver, as he joins us every single Wednesday. But starting this thing off here with an update and one to a Tonga Valoa. Folks, the former Alabama quarterback who's now with the Miami Dolphins has his official jersey number. He will rock number one for the Dolphins. He posted a photo to his Instagram on this week saying how he's representing the audience of one Tonga Valoa to wear number one. And this is cool because for a lot of people, you know, the argument was, would he choose 13? Will he try to wear Dan Marino's old number that's retired? You know, Dolphins looked at Marino as a legend, as a as a special marquee player, somebody that brought a lot to that franchise. And though some people were against, you know, to a possibly going with that number, other people were like, you know what, let the young man rock it, let's see what, what we could have here. But to a, going with the number one, sporting that for the Dolphins, hopefully the moment he gets his chance to get on that field, he will bring that franchise to a Super Bowl. But Tua Tonga Vangoa wearing number one for the Miami Dolphins. But diving into topic number one here of the conversation, and this was a topic that I, it's been going in my mind for the last two to three days, especially yesterday as I mulled around uh, the house just, just thinking about you know, this particular topic. And for me, Crimson Tide has got to get back to that. Got to get back to basics. Got to get back to having that physicality on both sides of the football, uh, specifically on defense. And uh, when you look at Twitter, when you look at social media nowadays, and you see the number of Alabama fans debating, having a dialogue, a conversation, a verbal spat, if you will. A lot of it is geared into, look at how college football is changing, right? Everything is going more so to offense. you got to have the dynamic, you know, wild quarterback. You have to have the offensive coordinator that's innovative, that's doing you know, all these different things and putting different pieces in motion. You have to be able to score points, score points, but not just that. You know, gone are the days where defenses are shutting teams out. Gone are the days where defenses are holding teams to less than 20 points. Gone are those times. Nowadays, for a defense, you have to hold on and hold on for dear life. And you have some Crimson Tide fans that have accepted that logic, seeing as how, you know, we saw what Tua Tonga Valor was able to do offensively, dropping 40 and 50 and sometimes 60 points when he wanted to and guiding this Crimson Tide front. And it was exciting. You know, it was fun. We, we, we drunk our beer to that. Like that, that, that. That was fantastic. But at the same time, you have a lot of, you know, Tide fans that go, that's great. That's awesome, but something's missing. It, it, it's not Bama football. Something is missing here. There's a key ingredient. There's a certain je ne sais quoi, if you will. Something is being left out. We, we're missing an essence here when you talk you know, Alabama football. And uh, 
I've had the joy and still have the joy of covering this program since 2009 uh, for Touchdown Alabama Magazine, extensively covering this program since 2011. So when I get the chance to walk into the athletic facility as often as I do, a, a number of different things catch my eye. And though I have seen these objects more than once, it's just always a refresher. So one of the things that catches my attention is always the words that are on the wall inside the players facility, inside the Mal Moore building, inside Brian Denny. There's just certain words that catch my, my eye. And those words, as you walk through the complex, are words like toughness, physicality, hard work, teamwork, determination, uh, hustle, just, just passion. So many words are on that, that wall that highlight what Bama football means, that highlight what Nick Saban has been teaching, what he's been instilling, what he's been trying to get this program to constantly understand, you know, for the longest of time. One of his favorite phrases, aside from make his butt quit, or y'all know the word he used. I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna say butt here, keeping it PG, but y'all know the phrase, the term he uses. But not only that one, but also the, the phrase, when Alabama leaves the stadium, when we leave Bryant Denny, or when we leave an opposing team's arena or venue, we want to have the notion on that team's mind, I do not want to play Alabama ever again. I, I don't want to play that program. I don't want to face you know, that team ever again. And uh, in the past, when you ask different offensive coordinators or players of different programs about Alabama, they would hit you with, they're well coached, they're a focused group, they don't make mistakes, they don't beat themselves up, they are very smart, highly intelligent, very instinctive, but on top of that, they force you to make mistakes, they force you to mess up, they catch you slipping, they capitalize on your turnover, so not only are they well-rounded when they have the football, they be in Alabama, but when the opposition has the football, the Crimson Tide is known for taking that ball away, uh, taking you out of your element, taking you out of your rhythm, and uh, that's that physicality, that's that toughness, that's that hard work, those, those qualities that has made Alabama what it is. And uh, the last two years, you know, Crimson Tide fans, they've looked at the offense, they said, yes, the offense is great, and you want to have a great offense, but where's the defense? Like, 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 where's the balance? Where is the Bama football? I'm used to seeing guys flying around the field, knocking guys' helmets off, flying down the field, sacking the quarterback, flying down the field, creating tackles for loss, flying down the field, uh, defending wide receivers, breaking up on passes. I'm used to seeing that in your face, that demoralizing, that, that make the other team feel depressed. Like, that's the Bama that I know. That's what a lot of fans talk about. That's the Bama I know. And can we get back to being, you know, that type of Alabama football team? And the physicality, the balance on both sides of the ball is key. For example, look at Georgia, for example. Georgia under Kirby Smart, they had one of the best defenses in college football this past year. They gave up 12.6 points per game. The only team that tore the Bulldogs up last year was LSU. And the only reason why it happened was, despite how good the defense was, the offense was below average. Jake Fromm had decent numbers, but you saw where he struggled. The play calling wasn't all that great, as the offensive coordinator Georgia had is now the tight ends coach now at Texas A&M. On top of that, the receivers were inconsistent. So all of this jumbled in together here, it caused... Georgia only to put up 10 points against the LSU and the SEC title game. It led to Jake Fromm, of course, getting drafted in the fifth round, though a lot of people thought he would be a first to second round guy. It was just a struggle, you know, for the Bulldogs. It had the defense, but didn't have the offense in terms of play calling, the physicality, but also being able to mix things up. Didn't have the balance there. But then you go to... Uh, Oregon and uh, Mario Cristobal balance there. And, and what's interesting here is uh, Kirby Smart and Mario Cristobal both sat under Nick Saban. They both got the same teaching. They both got the same tutelage. They both got the same butt chewings. Uh, they both got the same 
lessons from him on those core values on how to build a championship program. And Crystal Ball took that blueprint, right, of toughness, meanness, physicality, not allowing the opposition to outwork you. I'm better than the opposition. Having that mental edge, having that mental focus, having that uh, that mindset, Crystal Ball took this to the Pacific Northwest. He took it to Oregon to the Pac-12. And Pac-12, not known for defense. Pac-12, not known for toughness. Pac-12, not known for physicality. Pac-12, not known for bloody noses. Pac-12 is speed, finesse, Fun league. Have fun, run around, speed, finesse, space game. You know, that was the Pac-12. Um, especially for Oregon, you know, Mike Bellotti wasn't bringing physicality. Chip Kelly wasn't bringing it. Mark Helfrich wasn't bringing it. Definitely Willie Taggart wasn't bringing it. Physicality did not hit Oregon until Crystal Ball came there. And this past year, if you look at the stats going up on screen here, this is what... Crystal Ball brought Oregon. Defensively, once again, Oregon not known for defense before Crystal Ball. Oregon gave up 16.5 points per game this past season. That was ninth in college football. You know, Oregon had 41 sacks this past year. One of the best defenses in terms of that category. And Kayvon Thibodeau, the freshman that year, nine sacks and 14 tackles for loss. The Oregon Ducks had 20 picks this past season creating turnovers and the likes of Veron McKinley and Javon Holland each had four picks apiece so defensively Oregon also at 96 tackles for loss getting into the backfield disrupting the quarterback disrupting quarterbacks toughness physicality I'm not going to allow you to outwork me I'm going to be on your butt in your grill in your face getting after you that's what they did offensively you look at Oregon's offensive line yes it's got speed yes those guys can be able to move quickly nimble feet but they also got after you as well Oregon's offensive line helping CJ Verdell have a 1,000 yard year Oregon's offensive line helping Justin Herbert have his best season at quarterback we're talking 3,471 passing yards 32 touchdowns to six picks and with that physicality, with that toughness, with that hard hat mentality, Oregon wins the Pac-12, right? Oregon wins the Rose Bowl, and if not for a loss against Auburn to start the regular season, the Ducks are more than likely in the college football playoff. And it's because Crystal Ball took the blueprint that Nick Saban laid down and carried it to the Pacific Northwest. So if Crystal Ball can benefit from the old school Saban blueprint and uh, bring something new to the Pac-12, brought something new to Oregon, and they were able to buy into it and dominate off that, my question is, is why can't Saban brush off some of those old school tendencies and... Uh, go back to using those and dominating with those because uh, we've seen uh, last season where defenses in college football were able to stifle opposing offenses, were able to shut guys down, were able to you know keep guys, keep opposing teams off the scoreboard. And as much as uh, we see offense is important, and it is, as much as people look at Look at what LSU did. You know, look at what Clemson's doing with with, with, with Burrow and with uh, Trevor Lawrence. And uh, both of those quarterbacks, elite quarterbacks, elite talents. And people say, well, look what Tua did. But at the same time, uh, you know, Joe Burrow, elite talent. But when LSU's defense got healthy, that LSU defense, as physical as it was, played a huge role in the Tigers of LSU beating those Tigers, you know, of Clemson. As good as Trevor Lawrence was, that 2019 National Championship game off the 18th season, that Clemson defense did a phenomenal job affecting Tua Tagovailoa, throwing Alabama's offense different looks. Alabama was not able to capitalize off those looks. It frustrated the Crimson Tide. It frustrated the play calling. And, of course, Clemson went on to win that matchup 
44 to 16. So as much as people like offense, I'm not saying not to have an offense, do have an offense, but at the same time, when you talk Bama football, the Alabama fan base, they want to know, where is the balance? Where is the defense? Where is it knock them down, roll them over, make them feel like we can't do nothing. We can't move the football against Alabama. I go back to last year. There were moments where the opposition outworked Alabama, out-physical Alabama, out-toughed Alabama. Opposition wanted more than the Crimson Tide. And Nick Saban trying to get back to we got to want it more than the opposition but we're gonna take our first break here on in my own words the podcast just getting things started here on a wednesday upon our return we dive into your questions thoughts tweets text messages and concerns and it's coming right after this Every sports fan deserves the proper representation. Whitwill Sports introduces to you the title towel. Wave that title towel in the air like you just don't care. In support of Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Only $9.99 and it lasts a lifetime. Head on over to WhitwillSports.com and get your title towel today. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $5.95 per month or pay $49.95 for a full year subscription. That's a saving of almost $22. Make sure to subscribe before it's too late and get our new freshly printed end of the year magazine issue. Go to touchdown alabama.com today and roll tide we are back in from the break ladies and gentlemen on a wednesday hump day hottest show on the streets best form of alabama football news notes and information you will find anywhere in my own words the podcast with yours truly stephen m smith of touchdown alabama magazine and before we go to the phone lines right now. Got to give a quick shout out here to my father, Kenneth Smith, who is celebrating his 58th birthday on today. 58 years young. Happy birthday, Pops. Continue to do your thing and being the individual that you are, Pops. Love you, man. So Kenneth Smith, my pop, celebrating 58 years young on today. But it's your time, Alabama fans. 205-448-1358. 205 205- 448-1358 to get in on the conversation, to call to get in on the conversation, and we take our first call on a Wednesday. You are live on the show. What's going on? Hey, Mr. Steven Smith. How you doing today? I'm doing well, man. Can't complain. It's Wednesday. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. This is a uh, uh, Christian in Florida, uh Bama fan. Uh, I've called up on the show once or twice before. I, uh, in the comments section, I go by Ballard Sports Media, uh, but I'm a really big fan of the show and uh, really big Alabama fan. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on something. And there's talk about to uh, potentially sitting out a couple years with the Dolphins uh, just because they don't want to risk anything with like his health or whatever. What do you think? Should they sit him a couple of years? Uh, obviously, I think you let him play, but, uh, you know, they got Ryan Fitzpatrick, and even if they don't have, you know, him available, they got Josh Rosen. But I don't think two is in a position where he absolutely needs to start right away. What do you think? I think it needs to sit him one year. If, if the Dolphins feel yeah. like they need to sit him more than one year, that, that's on them. That's their call. But at least one year, I even say spot play him some in games because, you know, you drafted the number five overall. That jersey is going to be selling off the street like hotcakes. Uh, fans are going to want to see two uh, on the field. So I would say, yes, sit him a year. But if you feel comfortable in spot playing him in a couple of games, I would look at that direction also. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then I got a question about Alabama uh, for 2020. What do you think uh, – I, I, I hope our defense improves. I mean, it was just uh, – I mean, we gave up 40-something points to this team and that team, which Auburn and LSU are good teams, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, that's not really what we've seen from Nick Saban defenses. And he kept talking last year about the Bama factor – 
I didn't see it, especially on defense. I hope our defense gets better. I think it'll get better uh, now that – and you got to think, we played a lot of young guys last year. Now they have experience. Uh, but when you think of Dylan Moses coming back, hopefully he's not hurt this time. Uh, what do you think our strongest part of the defense will be, and what do you think the weakest part, like position-wise, will be? That's a good question. Uh, the str- the str- the strongest part of the defense would be uh, definitely, I would say, the defensive line because we would have Alabama would have three and four deep on the line. So the strongest part of the defensive line, weakest part, weakest part. That's a good question. Weakest part, give me outside linebacker for right now just because you got to find out who's that proven pass rusher. Right. And, and as I mentioned, too, even with Dylan Moses, we still have some pretty young linebackers, and normally you play two or three linebackers at a time. It's not just one. So uh, Dylan Moses, um, even though he had the injury last year, didn't play, he still has two or three other years where he did. And, um, you know, so he could definitely be there to help the younger guys out as well. So I think that would be uh, pretty well. But uh, anyway, thanks for taking my call and roll tide. Appreciate it, man. Got the first call there coming in from Chris. We go to our next caller in the queue. You're live with in my own words. Wayne, what's going on, buddy? Hey, 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 it's good to be back. DA, what's going on, Steven? Man, doing good. What, when you had me scared yesterday, man. I guess this was our payback from scaring you. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, I'd had a few, uh, uh, been about a four year run there without kidney stones. So I guess it was my time. The ghost caught up with me, huh? Mm. But you know what? Good Lord allows you to call in today, so we're going to just take the positive for the day. Yeah, you were talking about getting back to toughness. Yeah, we're going to take the positive for the day, getting back to toughness. I, that reminded me of what Coach Brian always said years and years ago. A lot of these young listeners don't remember, but I do. We have to be strong, and especially strong on special teams and the kicking game. Once again, special teams and the kicking game. Without being sound on those two things, you will be beat and beat quick. And we're at, and speaking of that, Wayne, we're actually going to dive into later on the show on a conversation about can Alabama find, can it finally locate that kicker? Can it finally locate that consistent leg? Because it feels like Coach Saban's able to recruit well at so many spots. He recruited a great punter. You know, in J.K. Scott, we know what J.K. did, but it's just finding out, can Alabama bring in that consistent okay. leg for field goals? When does it come in? Exactly. So that's what took me back to 1985, being strong on special teams and the kicking game, and that's what we was in those years. And we'll remember Mr. John Forney, Doug Layton, and also the – magnificent voice of Mr. Keith Richardson and all those people that have went on. But that's our poem for today, 1985. We'll end with our three hearty chuckles. And I uh, hope everybody loves this one. And I hope it takes you back way back when. Roses are red. Violets are blue. It was 1985. The kick made the news. It was the fourth quarter. The clock was rolling down. Shula drops back and lets a pass go downtown to a man named Richardson who scooted out of bounds. With six seconds left on the clock, a guy named Tiffin made a walk. With a snap of the ball and a mighty pop, the ball flew 52 behind the field goal it drops. A mighty, with a mighty yell, the Legion field rocked. All the Auburn Tigers knew the field goal had dropped. So, all right, Stephen, we're glad to be back there. Still not a little bit under weather. We're going to make it, though, my friend. Glad to hear about it down at TDA. Y'all be good. The good Lord's willing, we'll make it back in on Friday. And I hope Willie didn't drive by. Be careful, man. I'm out of here. Be good, Wango. We appreciate it. We appreciate it there from Wango. We got another call coming into the queue. You are live on In My Own Words. What's going on? What's up, Stephen M. Smith? How's it going, man? Man, I, I cannot complain, man. How you doing? Pretty good. So I was just calling to let you know that everything may be shut down in Michigan, but it's still green where I'm at here in Tuscaloosa. 
It's good that everything is still green in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> <laughs> Hold no, on, is, 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 the, hold uh, on. is this Vince? It is. Vince, man, what's going on? <laughs> Not much, man. I told you, everything's green down here. <laughs> what's on your mind tonight, man? No, uh, I was just calling to wish your, your dad a happy birthday to start off. Um, and I think when it comes to college football and what's happening is we're we're starting to look at other schools are – are pulling some of the same talent that Alabama was once pulling and they're changing the mentality um, that, that they had is like, yeah, Alabama's a good team, but we're just as good. That's what's going on with Clemson right now. Um, LSU is going to go through this rebuilding phase where they're looking for somebody to replace their quarterback. Um, So, yeah, I think, I think a lot of these teams are getting to this. Oh, we can beat Alabama. Alabama is beatable. So that's what I think is going to happen. And, you know, I'm still going to pull for Michigan State, but until they change that mind state, then Alabama's going to have to have some work to do coming up. So, so, so Vince, let me ask you this then. Do you see a loss on Alabama's schedule for this season? Because apparently ESPN does. Do you see one? Um, well, if we have a season, uh, I think the Auburn and LSU are going to be tough games, um, like always. Uh, uh, possible losses. It just really depends on when we can get back in the uh, training facilities to, to really get some, some work in. We will definitely see what happens down the road. But my man V, Vince, appreciate you calling in, man. Keep listening to the show. I got you, man. And Chanel says hey as well. She says she loves you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate the love that come from Vince and Chanel calling in. We're going to take another break here on In My Own Words, the podcast. How to show in the streets. Continue to hit us up in the chat line, 205-448-1358. The number to call into the show. But upon our return, we will sit down with former Bama wide receiver Matt Cadell talking Crimson Tide football after this. want delicious homestyle cooking, sushi, and hibachi, check out Otoro Hibachi in the University Mall in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. At home and you can't get away from the TV because the Crimson Tide is about to score? Don't worry. Delivery is also available through Waiter and Crimson To Go. That's Otoro Hibachi in the University Mall in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And make sure you let them know the good folks at Touchdown Alabama sent you. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $5.95 per month or pay $49.95 for a full year subscription. That's a saving of almost $22. Make sure to subscribe before it's too late and get our new freshly printed end of the year magazine issue. Go to touchdown alabama.com today and roll tide and we are rocking and rolling ladies and gentlemen on a wednesday hump day on the hottest show on the streets the best form of alabama football news notes and information you know what that is in my own words the podcast yours truly stephen m smith with the man the maestro john ivory in the building and we go to our in my own words hotline we pick up the former alabama player and the analyst for this show matt cadell matt brother you back again it's wednesday hope you're feeling good I'm feeling great. I'm doing well. Glad to be back on. Happy to have you back in here, Matt. Well, first and foremost, Matt, I mean, and I mentioned this in the first segment, you got Alabama trying to get back to you know, that game of physicality, trying to establish that Bama factor, making sure that this time around everybody knows what you know Nick Saban expects. So, you know, what does that why does Alabama need to, in your mind, why does it need to return to that style of physical football? Um, I just think that's the way Bama football is. I mean, you look back in history, um, where it's where Barry Krause with the goal line stand, uh, the 92 defense. Most of our championship teams have that physical um, defense for four quarters where we're disciplined. Um, uh, we set the tone of the game. Uh, we need to bring that physique back, you know, kind of have that mental psyche over our opponents where they cut on the film and say, you know, we don't want to have to play these guys, you know. Uh, 
uh, you know, just really having that physical identity, which really gives us an advantage on our opponents. And I think that's something Coach Saban's been trying to, um, you know, reestablish with these young guys, um, really bringing, when he mentions the Bama fact, they're really having that physical style of play. Um, and I think um, we're, I think he's doing everything he can to get us back to where we need to be. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, we, we are always at our best when we have that physical style of play, especially on the defensive end. Now, I know at times we don't like to be overcritical, but when you were watching games last year, did you see like certain moments where you felt like, this ain't Bama, man, this ain't right. So, some ain't clicking, man. Somebody put my pants back on. Let me go back out here on this field if I can claim some eligibility back. When you were watching games last year, did you kind of sense something that's different, something's not right? Uh, I think every Bama fan had those questions and those thoughts like, hey, what's really going on? This is not what we're used to. We're used to being so physical on defense. Um, especially on the defensive end, we had a lot of uh, made a lot of undisciplined mistakes last year, and we usually not only we're physical, but we're disciplined, especially from a Coach Saban led team, especially the, from the defensive end. So a lot of questions, you know, kind of arise in Bama fans as the season went on. And um, you know, I did have moments where I wanted to put on my uh, my pads and stuff, but um, you know, I would have joined you, you know, out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think just about every Alabama fan wanted to go out there, at least play linebacker or something, just make a tackle. Um, we weren't finishing plays like we used to. And I think, you know, we had that experience last year playing a lot of guys. And, um, I mean, a lot of guys were coming straight from high school and playing. So um, I think that's a learning experience. I think Coach Sabans have learned from it. I think our staff has learned from it, you know, defensive staff. I think that's going to make us better um, here coming up in the next couple of years, you know, how, knowing how not to avoid that or, or be in that same situation where we're making so many undisciplined and, and making not being physical on the defensive end. Folks, if you're just tuning in to the show here on the In My Own Words Hotline, we got former Alabama wide receiver Matt Cadell, played from 2003 to 07, talking some Crimson Tide football. Matt, even with COVID-19 and people adjusting, getting through it, you've got a lot of athletic directors, chancellors saying that doing everything possible to get the students and student athletes back on campus here by the fall. How many true freshmen, how many true freshmen for Bama – do you see legitimately making an impact on this team? Um, I, w I will say this. I wouldn't give a – I wouldn't quantify it, but I will say uh, each freshman will have the opportunity. Okay? Um, it's going to be up to them to, you know, how much they know in the playbook, how much do they transfer that on the field, um, how mature are they, uh, and just take advantage of the opportunity. Um, but some guys are going to have to play because of depth. I mean, you look at it on the defensive line, you know, guys like Tim Smith, Jamil Burroughs, um, at that defensive tackle, I think they're going to really have to step up and be mature and, and take advantage of those opportunities. Obviously, those young linebackers coming off the edge, Will Anderson, uh, Kondarius Robinson, uh, Drew Saunders, uh, Des Moines Kennedy. I mean, he's a stud. Uh, he can play inside, outside. Um, uh, Jackson Bratton, Chris Braswell, I think those are the guys uh, that will have the opportunity, and it's up to them to make the most of the opportunity. You look at the offensive side, obviously, you know, Bryce Young, he has an opportunity to compete with Mack and Talia. Um, but on the offensive line, you look at J.B. Cohen, um, Kai, he just has a, a mindset, which I love. It's about, uh, you know, he wants to come and be great. Uh, Damian George, offensive line. You look at the running backs. Uh, Rodell Williams, um, Seth McClellan, uh, I think those guys will have an opportunity because of depth. And obviously at the receiver position, uh, J.B. Baker, Ty Jones-Bell, Treshawn Holden, and <clears throat> back to the defense, you mean look at the secondary, uh, Brian Branch out of Georgia. He's very athletic, uh, cornerback, can play receiver. I mean, yeah, play receiver, it looks like he can play safety. Uh, Malachi Moore will have opportunities at Chris Robinson. Um, Ronald Williams, the JUCO tra uh, transfer. And I think Christian Story would have opportunity as well. I mean, I think he's kind that of that guy's like, good. Could be a sort. 
I think he can be a Swiss Army knife. He can play offense, defense. He can play. He can do it all. So yeah, I think, like I said earlier, it's going to be up to these freshmen to come in and take advantage of the opportunity. Now, now Jazz, re- reflecting early. back here on the defensive line for a minute, Matt, because you've got DJ Dale, who's got experience coming back from an injury, but behind him, uh, it, it's the battle of who's the next pure defensive tackle. Not necessarily tweener between tackle and end, but the next pure defensive tackle. You brought up Tim Smith and Jamil Burroughs, Jamarian Langham in there as well. Uh, if you look at a guy like, like an Ishmael Sopcher, how much potential or how much possibility does Ish does a Ishmael have, seeing how there's not much – there's a fight behind D.J. Dale for defensive tackle? Yeah, I, I think uh, Ishmael, he has – I mean, coming out of high school, you would have thought Ishmael would have been a plan, but I think he had to go through some growing pains. I think with the coaches like, um, you know, Freddie Roach, um, really getting to those guys, being able to relate, relate and bring the best. I think you'll see a, a much better production from guys like Ishmael Sauer, your DJ Dells, uh, Philander and Mathis, uh, those type of guys. And I think would kind of that will help um, set the tone of Alabama's defense being physical um, from the defense to tackle position. Folks, if you're just tuning in to the show here on a Wednesday, we're joined here by former Alabama wide receiver Matt Cadell talking some Crimson Tide football. And Matt, with, with the virus going on and, uh, you know, not having spring practice, have, trying to find a way to get summer practice in here, if that can happen, fall camp and things of that nature. But does the virus automatically position, you know, Mac Jones as the starting quarterback? Or do you see a scenario where maybe a Bryce Young, maybe a Talia Tungavango, or maybe a Paul Tyson, somebody else takes this job at the starting role? Does the virus automatically say, okay, Mac's the guy? Um, I think Matt would get the lead initially, obviously, because, you know, he has the most experience. Um, he played um, back up for Tua last year and, you know, did a great job. Um, we didn't, and, you know, Talia uh, was our backup last year after Tua went down. And I think um, you cannot overlook experience. And I think they kind of have the upper edge, but, you know, they have to compete. You know, they cannot be – um, complacent or just um, think they got it, the job in that bag because it's so competitive, especially with the Bryce Young coming in and number one, uh, one of the top players coming out in the country and the nation. Um, they're going to have to bring their air game every year because of that young guy is coming. Uh, he's very, has a lot of poise. Um, <clears throat> he has the mindset uh, to be a winner to compete and I think he's going to push everybody in that quarterback room. But to answer your question, I think Mac Jones uh, really sets us in a good position uh, to go forward with this uh, football season, knowing that we have a quarterback with experience um, uh, leading into this football season with this COVID-19, uh, having no spring training. Uh, I think that helps us in the long run. As always, he's Matt Cadell, folks. Join us every Wednesday to break down Crimson Tide football. Former Alabama wide receiver Matt, as always, appreciate you for coming on, spending some time with us, continue to stay safe, be good. Looking forward to the next Wednesday, brother. All right, thanks for having me. Matt Cadell always join us live here on the show. We're going to take a, another break here, folks. Don't touch that down. Still getting the thing rolling, rolling, rolling. Upon our return, we get into more of your phone calls, thoughts, tweets, questions, and concerns. Bring them in after this. Menswear in the University Mall in Tuscaloosa. 
Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $5.95 per month or pay $49.95 for a full year subscription. That's a saving of almost $22. Make sure to subscribe before it's too late and get our new freshly printed end of the year magazine issue. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. Back inside the action, people, on a Wednesday, hottest show on the streets, best form of Crimson Tide football news, notes, and information in my own words, the podcast with yours truly, Stephen M. Smith and the man John Ivory. And as always, Bama Nation, it is your time. 205-448-1358. Phone lines open. 205-448-1358 to call and let your voice be heard. Give your thought, your opinion, if you want to vent, whatever you want to do. The floor is yours. 205-448-1358 to call in. But first, we're going to go to our YouTube comment section. Uh, John Ivory, hit me one time with the big man. Uh, Senator Hines Jr. asks, do you think this year's defense will force us to flood the field with true freshmen with all the talent coming in? I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say flood the field with true freshmen. There will be some true freshmen that will play on defense. I think Will Anderson will get out there. I think Drew Sanders can get out there. I don't think you'll be able to keep uh, Tim uh, Tim Smith off the field at defensive tackle. So there would be about, I could see six to seven. About, about seven true freshmen could potentially hit the field. Seven on defense. But you do have a ton of experience returning led by, of course, Dylan Moses and Christian Barmore. So not a lot of freshmen, but maybe seven. Willie351 asks, how do you think the secondary is going to do this year? Secondary. It comes down to the leadership of Patrick Sertan taking that next step. Freshman year was awesome. Sophomore year kind of had some struggles. Did play it well, but had some struggles. So Sertan, he's got to be the leader of that back five. Him along with Daniel Wright as a first-year starter. Jordan Battle growing into his second year. You know, Josh Job having that physicality but not being overly physical. But it starts with Patrick Sertan. He's got to take that next step in being the leader. Jay Lee asks, do you think DeMarco Hellams will make a push for a starting spot? Ooh, I love that young man right there. And wait, Willie, Willie 351 said, who, who Hellams going to start over? <laughs> okay, hold on now, hold on now. DeMarco, and, and I remember, I spoke to Jared Maiden a couple of weeks back before he signed his his uh, um, his undrafted free agent deal with the 49ers. And Maiden was talking to me about how, you know, DeMarco – has dropped some weight. He came in a little bit heavy at 6'1", 213. He's now 6'1", 202. DeMarco would start at that dime safety, that dime linebacker position that Xavier McKinney had this past season. Now, DeMarco could push for one of the two safety spots, free or strong. It's going to be tough for him. But right now, if the chips just fall right now, DeMarco Helms would start in the dime package as that dime safety, that dime linebacker, taking on tight ends and things of that nature, and also playing in the box. I would have him as that dime safety. But really an uh, interesting topic here is um, as you look at – all of these presidents and chancellors and athletic directors trying to make sure that they can get the students and the student athletes back on campus. According to a couple of tweets here from Clay Travis, who is with Fox Sports, uh, outkicked the coverage on Fox, and also Brett McMurphy, formerly of ESPN, now working for Stadium. Tennessee, the Tennessee Volunteers, have become the latest program, the latest school to ensure that they're going to try its best to have the students and the athletes back on campus by the fall. This comes from Tennessee Chancellor Don Plowman. Don Plowman, uh, Ms. Plowman made it known today that uh, Tennessee is going to have or push to have the students and the student athletes back on campus. And that makes Tennessee... LSU, Alabama, Texas A&M, Missouri, Arkansas, South Carolina, and Georgia among the schools that are are bent on or they're all in, as I should say, on getting everybody back in school, ensuring that there will be a football season or there's going to be 
a football season. The only schools that we have yet to get information like this on, you have Florida, you have Ole Miss, you have Mississippi State. Uh, I haven't, We haven't heard anything from Vanderbilt yet also. So for the most part, there are some schools out there trying to get back into you no know, college football. And, and John, I, I want to ask you this question. John, do you think they're shooting – from the hip at this, do you think they're pulling this way too soon? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know if the schools, you know, have to say so to say we're gonna have football, and uh, I've seen a lot of that. So I'm like, how are you gonna say that? We still gotta wait and see. So, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's a wait and see thing. They're trying to make sure that the dorms are sanitized and disinfected, the stadiums are sanitized and, dis- and disinfected. You know, my thing is as much precaution as you can take. And as much as you want to assure that people are not going to lose their minds, because when, when, when the spring sports, when the sports were initially taken away the live sports, people were already you know, sort of losing it. But if you remove the fall sports, in particular football, from people, you know, they're going to really lose it. And I've always been an advocate for you never know how much you are invested in something until it's removed from you. Now, am I saying we're wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in sports? No, but it does make the day go by. It does start a great conversation. It does break the ice. It's something that has become the fabric of our life. So, you know, if this happens, John, if we do have a season, I, how do you expect it You know, to go the first couple of months where – you're going to have fans in the stands. People are going to be wearing their mask on. Like, how could you see this going just as a casual fan? I mean, it's so far down the line. I mean, everything could be cleared up. But I'm, I'm sure people will have masks and stuff like that. Or maybe it'll, at that time, it, we, don't, we, we won't need masks. I don't know. I think it's just a hope thing going on. Like, they're just trying to keep hope alive and, you know, keep the spirit of football in people's hearts. And we will have SEC football. Let's do it. We <laughs> they're, have trying, college football. They're, try, they're trying to do everything they can. And, and, and I, I said, I, I respect that because, you know, once again, football is king in athletics, especially college football. People like basketball. Don't get me wrong. People like basketball. People like baseball. I'm a softball guy myself. I couldn't stand the fact that Team 24, you know, for the Crimson Tide, was not able to still have a softball season. People like baseball. People like gymnastics, but you know, for, for 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 a lot of programs that are not the marquee, you know, power five programs, the fans are not wired into the other sports like they're wired in in football. They're not donating, they're not giving, they're not contributing, as I should say, to the other sports like they do football. If football was removed, you would see a lot of schools lose money. You would see a lot of schools go bankrupt. You would see almost kind of the Great Depression, if you will, because for for, for a lot of these programs, they depend on football. Even for the idea of, okay, let's have an abbreviated football season, right, where you're having maybe eight to nine conference games and not the non-conference games. Yes, the eight to nine conference games would be great because you would get competitive football and people want competition. People want high quality games. People want to be able to sit down and watch a compelling matchup on the edge of their seat. But at the same time, if you remove the non-conference games and these are where these other programs, they make their money from playing the big dogs. Like a UAB make their money from playing a, well, not UAB, a Troy University makes their money from playing an LSU. A Western Kentucky, a Western Carolina, they're going to make their, you know, one to two million dollar payday from playing Alabama, from playing Tennessee. Are they going to get their butt waxed? Yeah. They're going to get drug up from the floor. <laughs> but they're going to they get that check. Like, they're going to get that check. It's like ODB, man, free money. They're going to get that check. They're going to get that pay because they know, hey, we finna come on national TV. We gonna get our butts handed to us on a platter. But when that check in the mail, ching ching, we gonna we gonna get that money and we gonna take it and we're gonna invest it into our athletic facilities. We're gonna invest it into our weight room. We're gonna invest it into our nutrition staff. We're gonna invest it into our you know future enrollment. So playing the big schools, you know, playing the big dogs is a way for for small programs, you know, the little guys to 
to build up, to grow up, to to get you know, that foot in the door. And yeah, if they're you gonna do, do something. They gotta do something. Something's gonna happen for I, sure. I, sure, sure. Something's gonna happen. I, I I just wanted to get you know your take on this junk because I know you know you in the Birmingham area, you being in a in a, in a big you know metropolitan space. I kind of wanted to get your viewpoint on should this happen. You know, are they shooting off at the hip too much? Are they doing? Are they going about this too soon? The hope is that by June, July, the sun burns this all off. We can get back to a sense of normalcy. But but since you being a guy from you know a much bigger city than when I'm from, I kind of just want to get your thoughts on that. Hey man, don't get my location out, man. I got I got girls watching the show, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I'm not trying to, man. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to. But anyway, we're going to take another break here on In My Own Words, the podcast. But upon our return, we dive into a topic of field goal kicking. Will Alabama ever return to having strong kickers? We'll touch it up after this. If you're an avid Alabama Crimson Tide fan and you love to flaunt it, then show your Alabama Crimson Tide support by grabbing the Alabama sneakers. They feature bold Crimson Tide graphics, so no one will be able to question where your allegiance lies. When you add these sweet sneakers to your Alabama Crimson Tide collection, go to stsfootwear.com and use the code TDALABAMA for $15 off your purchase. That's code TDALABAMA for $15 off your purchase. Go to stsfootwear.com and get your Alabama sneakers today. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $5.95 per month or pay $49.95 for a full year subscription. That's a saving of almost $22. Make sure to subscribe before it's too late and get our new freshly printed end of the year magazine issue. Go to touchdown alabama.com today and roll tide back into the conversation ladies and gentlemen on a wednesday a hump day in my own worst the podcast yours truly stephen m smith of touchdown alabama magazine appreciate you guys rocking and rolling with us and we get down to field goal kicking will alabama ever get that uh that kicker nick saban has always been able to recruit you know, all 22 non-specialized positions, 11 on offense, 11 on defense. He's been, he's been able to recruit those positions well. Recruited a great punter in J.K. Scott. But the kicker, will Saban ever be able to get back to getting the kicker? And uh, what's what's crazy is, is that for, 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 for Alabama fans out there, for Alabama fans out there, and, and, and I've heard this from all angles. Some fans go, well, Steven, this is what happened. We sacrificed our kicking to get to a tongue of Iloa. And you know what? <laughs> you know what? I can see that happening. Other fans will go, no, nah, Steven, he he lying. Um, see what happened was we get the kickers, but you know that scene off space jams where the monsters suck all the folks' powers away? That's what happened, man. They get to Alabama and all their power of kicking gets sucked away. I've heard that being told. And then other folks go, Steven, I don't think we're recruiting the right type of kicker. I think we need to recruit just a, a, a specific body type, a specific leg, a specific structure. I, I don't know if we're going about this recruiting the right way, Steven. Something got to give. And it, it goes back to kind of like this. You know, for my ladies out there, for my women out there, for, well, for my fellas out there first, very rarely do you meet that woman that's a 10 all across the board. You may have some that's an 8 here and there, a 9 here and there, a 7 here and there. But when you meet that 10 across the board, you're thinking, my God, I ain't going to let this woman leave me. I'm going to shoot my shot right now, regardless of what happened. I'm shooting my shot right now. Ladies, the same thing. You meet that fine brother, I, I, either, either he's shooting his shot at me or I'm going to shoot my shot at him. Something got to give. Something got to happen. I'm not letting this person leave my sight. And it's the same thing with Bama football in terms of the kicking game. At some point, Bama's got to hit on the kicker. And what's crazy is there was one point in time where field goal kicking was not an issue for Alabama. I mean, for a while there, you had Van Tiffin 
who was dynamic. You had Philip Doyle, who was good. Michael Proctor was good. Uh, Brian Bostick in the early 2000s was good. You, you even had Jamie Christensen. And I remember Jamie Christensen because Jamie, that ball used to come off Jamie's foot as ugly as sin. But that ball used to go in every single time. It looked like a Tim Wakefield knuckleball. But Jamie used to be clutch with it. Every single time. I remember back in 05, he had three game-winning kicks, one against Ole Miss, one against Tennessee, and the third one came against Texas Tech you know, in the bowl game. So Christensen was was accurate with the foot. I mean, even down to you know, Lee Tiffin, he had his struggles early on, but he got right 08, 09. Jeremy Shelley was right, probably the only you know, perfect kicker as far as percentage Alabama has had in a long time. And then... You know, 2013 happened, and of course, Cade Foster came through, and Cade in the Iron Bowl in 2013, all you had to do, Cade, was make one field goal, and, you know, Cade struggled there, and poor Adam Griffith, we had to put Griff out there, and, you know, the 57-yarder didn't happen, and ever since Cade Foster in 2013, there has been an issue, you know, in the kicking game, and for... Alabama fans, you have to sit there and watch other schools like Georgia, like Auburn, like LSU, who tend to keep great kickers every year, like clockwork, and they're out there making 57 and 58 and 60-yard field goals off the dirt like it ain't nothing consistently. And as an Alabama fan, you look and you go, oh, no, must be nice. Wow, Todd Nation, you guys have to sit there and cuss and swear and chant and drink trying to get through the stage of the field goal kicking. And kind of a funny story I go back to is I got a friend of mine who, who's been a Bama fan since the Bear Bryant regime. Her and her son, I tailgate with both of them, they attend every game. And they were at the 2015 matchup between Alabama and LSU with Bryant Denny. And the score is tied at 10, about to go into halftime. Adam Griffith comes up for a 50-yard field goal. And everybody in the stadium is going, oh, man, oh, man, oh, God, no, not anybody but Griff. And you got the ladies who are reaching for their flask of tequila. I don't know if it was Don Julio or 1800, but they're reaching at the bottom part of that purse to grab that flask going, baby, I got to take this edge off. The kicker up here, I'm already nervous. I'm going through my first five to six cuss words. Let me grab the flask. You got the fellas reaching for the Jack and Coke, trying to put up to their mouth going, save, but just go for it, man. Ain't, ain't got time for the kicker. And so here comes my friend who is literally chanting to herself, it's only just an extra point. It's only just an extra point. It's only just an extra point. And she starts chanting it louder and louder and louder until folks are saying, woman, what is you doing? She's like, I'm trying to help Adam Griffith. I'm trying to help the kicker. So she's chanting this, right? Adam Griffith goes up there, he makes the 50-yard kick, and everybody in Brian Denny just loses. They're going, holy crap, he made it. Oh, my gosh, it went through. How, how did you do that? You got to say that chant every single time. You hear me? Every time there's a game, you got to say that chant. So from that game on forward, my friend, Miss Brenda, is literally at the game going, it's only just an extra point. And when she doesn't say it, everybody turns to her and goes, why you ain't saying the chant? Now we're going to miss this kick because you ain't chanting. Now we're going to miss this kick because you ain't on your post. So it's crazy how for Alabama fans, y'all have got to go through the chanting, the cussing, the swearing, the drinking to get a field goal made. But when you look at the two kickers Alabama has, first and foremost, you look at Will Reichert here. For Will Reichert, the hope is that, you know, he's the guy, that he can mentally be the guy for the Crimson Tide. He came out of Hoover High School, strong leg, accurate leg, big-time kicker. Unfortunately, you know, he got hurt, had the hip flexor against Southern Miss, Alabama put him back out there too quickly against Tennessee to try to punt the ball. The young man, highly uncomfortable. You could see it. Hopefully, you know, putting him back out there prematurely, it did not rattle his confidence. It didn't shake his confidence. So hopefully he will have the mental fortitude to, uh, to get back out there. Also, 
you look at uh you go you go to Ty Piron right here. So Ty Piron is a guy that you know we saw this past season. Tremendous punter, you no know, great punter, and uh, not only punted the football well, but flew down the field, made tackles, had fans hyped up, had fans in shock and all. I think this is the guy that needs to be kicking the field goals because, according to his high school coach, I got a chance to talk to him, King of Ross, at a Pratt field, and. Uh, a good friend of mine who also trained at Ty P. Ryan. The guy made a few, you know, game-winning field goals at Prattville, including one against Stan Hope Elmore. So, Nick Saban, if you're listening here, this needs to be the kicker. Ty P. Ryan the kick, Will Rock with the punt. I'm just going to call it at that. Hopefully, at some point, we get the kicker in here that does his thing. But, as always, Tide fans, you want the best in news, notes, information, and coverage on your Crimson Tide. It's simple. You download the Touchdown Alabama Magazine app. You get this on your iPhone. If you're rocking Team Apple, Google Play Store, if you've got the Android phone, the podcast options, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Overcast.fm, or iHeartRadio, we have you covered here on the network. If the good and gracious Lord sees fit, I will return on Friday talking Crimson Tide football. Also, be sure you haven't done so. Hit that subscribe button on the side. Turn on those notifications so that you can get the updates. Until next time, though, folks, husbands, love your wives. Wives, appreciate value. Those husbands, children, find those ways to legitimately not be bored. Get those three hearty meals a day, those three great laughs a day. Protect yourself and protect the loved ones around you. Till next time, folks, spending my own words.